He's coming. You guys, he's coming. You need to repent. Repent. You know, today the theme of repentance reaches a whole new level. There are consequences to not repenting. Turn or burn. You ever hear that phrase? There are plenty of positive reasons to repent. You know, it's clear that repentance is a healthy for life. And ultimately relationship. You know, not too many will admit that being deceived, being a fool, or being ignorant is good. And but sadly, that's the course that some choose for their lives. They try to put God in a box or a temple made by hands that they can open or visit when convenient. On this course, their works of service are done out of their strength or out of guilt, or motivated by pride, or even selfish ambition. And not from the strength of the Holy Spirit, motivated by love and relationship, or ultimately God's glory. You know, as they progress against God's will, they mold a God that fits their comfort level, rather than they themselves being moldable to His image, bringing them up to His love. Oh, glory to say. His level of love and relationship. They do not esteem others better than themselves to integrate into the body of Christ, of believers, as accepting, forgiving, loving brothers and sisters in Christ. Please let's turn to Acts 17 and 26. Repentance is putting off all that ignorance and entering into a wonderful, joyous, Relationship with God the Father, the Holy Spirit, God the Son, and the body of Christ. God pleads for us all to enter that wonderful relationship, that celebration, that eternal celebration. This is all a great and positive motive to repent. You know, this is exciting. Woohoo! It's going to be a glorious day. We can be excited for it. But there's also a negative. Motivation that I mentioned earlier as well. Judgment. That day will bring judgment. Those headed down the natural course of doing what is right in their own eyes are headed for destruction. You know, hell is not an empty threat. And hell is not there just so that God can say, you go to hell if, if, if you don't listen to me. He, he's not doing it just because he wants, he, 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 he says the ultimatum. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. And in order for you to end up there, you're going to have to go over Christ's dead body. You will have to reject God's offer of salvation through Jesus Christ and continue going down your course. Judgment is real and imminent. God has done everything to give you what you need for eternal life and godliness. Repentance is turning from judgment to love and relationship. You know, it's a no-brainer. Continue on reading, or read this again, I should say, um, Acts 17. Start with verse 26. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we well, hear his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice, by the man he is appointed, he has given proof of this to all men 
by raising him from the dead. Repent. Repent. And we looked at we need to repent from ignorance. And we can't just go along in life and expect it's going to be okay. God has got his word out there. God has got his messengers out there. And, and if you just try to close them off, God's going to hold you accountable. Anyway. Two, things done by the hand of containment. God does not live in a temple built by hands. A temple made by hands. We can't put God in a, in a spot and say, okay, God, that's your spot. I'm going to go do my things my way when I'm not in your presence. And then I'm going to, okay, now it's your time, God. No, that's not the way it works. Religion. God's not served by hands. You know, we can't do anything of ourselves to please God. God doesn't have need of anything. But through His strength, through His power, we can turn that religion into an offering of love and freedom and relationship. Idolatry. We need to repent from idolatry. God is not made by hands. So many times we, we live our lives and, and uh, rather than, than be molded to God's image, we mold God and fit Him in the way we want to live. We bring Him down to our level rather than being lifted up to God's level. What to? Relationship to seek God. God is near us. And what for? To be ready for judgment. And then there's a the proof. The resurrection. Please let's turn to 2 Thessalonians 1. Starting with verse 3. Point number 6. The second to the last point is ready for judgment. There are consequences to non-repentance. You know, God is loving God loves us so much that He gave His Son. But this doesn't mean that, that we can just go, okay, God loves me, He's not going to harm me. God's got some judgments planned for those that don't do His will. For those that don't accept His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus may have been led like a lamb to the slaughter in the front of the courts and the judgments of men and, the, and this world and the power of darkness. But when He takes His place, His place in the judgment seat on that glorious day or wherever that time is in the end, He will judge justly with power of death and resurrection to follow through with His final judgment, decision. He will not be swayed by false testimony or persuasive words. The tables will be turned and those that have been actively judging will soon be actively judged according to their heart. And the punishment will be immediately carried out. God's patience will be completed on that day and give way to his awesome wrath. This, in, this imminent judgment is not something to fear for those that have trusted Christ. By repenting of their old, ignorant ways of serving the devil, the world, and themselves. You don't got to fear it. If you trusted Jesus, your focus is on relationship and faith, not a continual fear of judgment. There is no fear for those that have believed and loved God. Paul contrasts the repentance and the unrepentance in the next passage. Start with verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians 1. We always ought, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. And the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Oh man, that's awesome! Listen to, listen to his, 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 his response. This is, this is the church he's talking to. And he's saying, this is how, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is an example of how you ought to live. We ought to always thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. And the love everyone has for you is, for, 
has the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about you, about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you're enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. Now that's awesome. Isn't that awesome? That's, that's following God's will. That's the repentant nature of man. Or not nature of man. That's the repentant work of God. That's what the church looks like in repentance. Verse 6. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. And give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. It doesn't say an if here. It's saying when. It's imminent. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of His power. On that day, He comes to be glorified. We say, Glor glorious day. On that day, He comes to be glorified in His holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. Okay, they're not part of that judgment here. They're, they're marveling. They're glorifying this Christ. This includes you because you have believed our testimony to you. Talking to the Thessalonian church there. And we saw how they were. Verse 11. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that God may count you worthy of His calling. He counts you worthy of His calling. And that by His power, He may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Let's please turn to Romans 2, 5. There's a judgment. There's a judgment of punishment for those who do not know God. For those that do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it, it, it just triggers some emotions here. For one, where am I at? And another, where are the others at? Does your heart break for those? Remember, knowing God does not come from a careful study of theology. <clears throat> knowing God comes from having Him formed in you through obedience of the gospel. The word worthy jumps out twice in this passage. And there are two different forms, two different comparisons. You know, worthy of the kingdom, worthy of your calling. Now I'm reminded how Frosty Hansen brought about the balancing scales to picture this word worthy. It's the word that had axios in it, like, a, like an ax, ax, axle, fulcrum, balance. No, you don't, you can't do it under your own power. It is the Holy Spirit that makes the trans, transformation and the good fruits, the balance with God's righteousness and holiness. Does your life, does your life balance with God's righteousness and holiness? Is that part of your life? Are you worthy of His kingdom? Are you worthy of His calling? Do the fruits in your life, the Jesus in you, represent what's in the other side of the scale, God's holiness, God's righteousness. It is 
the covering of Christ's righteousness that covers and ultimately eliminates the sin that originally tipped the scales to judgment. It is the inheritance as God's children, that new life, that conceived Christ inside, that develops true transformation into the image of Christ. Does your life balance with this? Now the word counted precedes worthy both times in the NIV. Counted worthy. What counts as being worthy? Keeping God's commands. God's commands is what counts. What counts is a new creation. I heard this uh, at camp this week. It was a quote. Heaven is not full of people afraid of hell. It is full of people desiring to please God. You know, I remember when I repented and trusted Jesus as my Savior. I was five years old. I was riding a bus to school. And my bus driver told me about Jesus. And told me about hell. And that I was headed to hell. Now, I was an innocent little five-year-old kid. I don't know what ever prompted this bus driver to talk to me in this way. <laughs> but I tell you what, she made, she made an impact on me. And I tell you what, I trusted Jesus as my Savior. Because I didn't want to go where that bus driver told me I was headed. <laughs> The imminent judgment that I faced as an unredeemed little child got my attention. And I literally chose to turn and not to burn. I chose Christ. I chose to have Him be my life, to be transformed into His image. Jesus changed me. He changed my life. A five-year-old kid doesn't do that. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And that's His work in you. It's free. It's strong. It's powerful. True repentance is turning to God's work in your life. It is trusting your life to Him and not leaning on your own understanding. If you don't repent, that is when you ought to be very concerned. And if the positive pleadings to come and enter God's family do not cross us into repentance, Maybe you ought to take a serious look at the alternatives. Romans 2, verse 5. Paul said this, But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persisting and doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, with glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, and then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. And then it goes on, but I want to skip down to verse 16. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ as my day gospel declares. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. When? Not if. Imminent. It's going to happen. It should scare us to doubt. Scare us to repent. Scare us to cause our friends our loved ones to cause us to say, hey, we need to go to them. It should break our hearts. Please, let's turn to uh, Hebrews 10.1. 
10 to 22. Now God has not given us a spirit of fear. You know, Paul's gospel declares that there will be a judgment of the secrets of the hearts. Not only of the secrets of the hearts, but, but according to each person, what he has done. You know, you can mask your heart before men. You can even deceive yourself with your defense. I'm all right. And so be deceived. Your twisting of reality and truth or just plain ignorance can cause you to feel justified in your own mind. God calls you to repent from ignorance, doesn't He? God calls you to repent from playing house or temple when your hearts are far from Him. God calls you to repent from thinking that your actions, power, influence, or anything done in your power can really benefit God or move Him to think the way you think and thereby escape his judgment. It's when, not if. God calls you to repent for forming him through your design and skill, either tangible or by some other type of concept, abstract concept of who God is. God's undoubtedly. It's not him that needs to be formed or even, even understood. It's us that they need, need to understand who God is by how He works in our lives. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now He commands all people everywhere to repent, for He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising Him from the dead. He is risen from the dead. You know, may God lift the veil of ignorance to the truth. May God roll the stone away from the hard hearts and show the risen Christ. The risen Christ of love. The risen Christ of redemption. The risen Christ of reconciliation. Bringing together a church, a body of Christ. May you face this truth and repent. Hebrews 10 22 says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Wow. There's some impactful words there. Impactful words. But let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifices for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses, this was back in the Old Testament, the Old Dispensation, anybody who rejected that law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as unholy the thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified him? Who has treated as unholy? No. Who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him? and who has insulted the Spirit of grace. For he, for we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Please let's turn to Matthew 23, 29. Turn around. Now look back at this passage. What are you set? 
The first part of this passage is awesome. It talks about the full assurance of faith. It talks about the cleansing of our hearts and the conscience and even our body by Him who is faithful. I mean, it, it, it goes the whole gamut. You know, the body, the mind, the soul, the spirit, your actions, your thoughts, your communication, your relationship. And he says, this is hard from stuff. Then he talks about our relationships, our relationships with each other. Not, not that stopping fellowshipping with one another, but encouraging one another. Great stuff. It talks about holding on to this activity and the miracle of God by spurring one another on to love and good deeds. Fellowshipping with one another and encouraging one another. Is this where we're at? If it is, there's no fear of judgment. This is the promise God holds out for us. We read about this relationship in Acts 2. In, in, in 2 Thessalonians, I mean Acts 17, in, in 2 Thessalonians, in Romans, and in Hebrews, along with the offer comes the alternative. The Lord will judge His people. Before we look at how He will judge us, how was he judged? How do we judge him? Well, of course, we were not there when Jesus was taken through the courts, when he was taken down that, that road, when he was drawn to the hill of Golgotha. We weren't there. We didn't hail him, did we? We didn't curse him, did we? We didn't mock him, hit him, spit him, lie about him, whip him, beat him. We didn't hang him up on that cursed tree, did we? No, ah, we weren't there. But there's a connection to Jesus right here with how you treat each other. Can, you can trample the Son of God underfoot in this day and age. As Jesus explains in Matthew 23, 29, He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zachariah, son of Berechiah, who we murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all this will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, you would kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. Look, your house has left you desolate. Your house has left you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One more. <coughs> Jesus, God's Son was crucified. To gather to himself the sons of disobedience. And who are those sons? We are sons. Are you willing? Our sin set each of us on a course for hell. I was five and I was headed for hell. And my bus driver knew it. Okay? Jesus made a way through his suffering and sacrifice for your repentance or turning from that course by entrusting your lives to him. He wants to gather you under his wings as a hen gathers her chicks. And I remember a story about a fireman. They'd, they'd uh, 
they completed fighting a fire. And this stupid old hen was stuck right in the middle of the black and she was dead. One of the firemen said, stupid, stupid chicken, and kicked it. And out from underneath that chicken came a bunch of healthy baby chicks. Jesus. A lot of people say he's a fool. He was God. He came to be one of us. Made himself of no reputation. Came nothing. And he humbled himself unto death. Even the death of the cross. And he would rather have you gather underneath him. Under the protection of his wings. So that in his death, and in the foolishness of his love for you, you'll be preserved into eternal life. He sends out his messengers to plead for you to be gathered. How do you respond to them? God may be getting very personal with you today. Jesus was not giving an empty threat in this gospel and the rest of his word. The threat can do several things. It can cause repentance. It can be unheeded warning too as well that men may upon receiving the punishment not have an excuse. It can be a source of relief and solace that as Jesus is formed in us we can be grateful for his work on the cross to take away our punishment. And finally it's a huge incentive to go from person to person to person to give them the good news as if Jesus, God, were pleading through you be reconciled. Be reconciled to God. May the Holy Spirit give you understanding into this plea. And may you not reject it. Be reconciled to Christ. Let's pray.